Good morning, good afternoon from Barcelona, and welcome to a new Reno webinar. This is Pedro here, and today I'll be presenting with my colleague at the McNeil Europe, uh, Carlos Perez. Uh, we continue this series of videos where we discover new ways of using Rhino development tools by inviting and talking to experts in different fields. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with Brandon Pachuca. He's an urban data scientist and a web developer at KPF UI, uh, team focused on leveraging emerging uh, technologies to augment in some way the architectural um, practice. Brandon has a background both in architecture and urban planning. And today we will have a session where Brandon is going to show how he uses Rhino Compute to perform uh, spatial analytics and uh, modeling using New York City uh, tax log data as a case study. So um, I let Brandon start presenting and uh, Carlos and I will be here in the chat collecting the, the questions uh, you might have for him. So Brandon, thanks again for being, for being our, our guest today and feel free to start uh, whenever you want. Fantastic. Thanks, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen here. I'll just go ahead and share the entire screen since I'll be going back and forth. Okay, so let me just get my, my Zoom stuff situated. Got to like fix all the windows. Okay, so slideshow. Great, so thank you all so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Pedro, and uh, thank you, Carlos, for inviting me here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be talking about spatial analytics on, on this stage. And thank you so much. A huge shout out to McNeil in general, because like all the work that all the work I've done within architecture and urban data science is made possible by the wonderful tools and extensions and innovations done by McNeil. So thank you all so much. And thank you all for joining this presentation and sharing your time with me. So for, uh, I always like to get started with an agenda so you know what to expect throughout the presentation. So I will do a brief introduction of myself and my background so you kind of know where I'm coming from and how I got here. Then I'll dive into Rhino Compute and data science and navigating what these technologies are and how they can be used in practice. And then we'll be going hands-on, moving through a Jupyter notebook and some code to actually see how they interconnect with one another. And then I will show a recent example of how it's being used in our office here at KPF. So uh, to make this webinar just a, a tiny bit more interactive, uh, the part of the reason I fell in love with this community when I came here uh, to New York in particular is that the community behind computational design and this like intersection between technology is so warm and so welcoming. So if you feel comfortable, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I always find it interesting to meet new people uh, because it's like, it's like a small field, but it's a very large field at the same time. So always like meeting new uh, new individuals within our field. So as Pedro and Carlos uh, pointed out, like my name is Brian Pachuca and I'm an urban data scientist and web developer working at KPFUI uh, on the, at Con Pearson Fox Architects, focused on deploying technologies across our studio as products to deliver analytics and insights throughout the design practice. I have a background in architecture and urban planning and recently received my master's in applied urban science and informatics from NYU. So where I started at is I graduated from the University of New Mexico with my bachelor's in architecture and urban planning. And with, while in architecture school, like many others, I was inspired by Greg Lynn after reading Animate Form, which kickstarted my journey of exploring space and time by using digital interfaces. The project above Cubes was one of my first scripts I ever wrote in Maya 3D, specifically the Maya embedded language, which had three cubes, the orange, red, and teal, interact with a field of similar uh, cubes and attempt to change the color of the nearby, nearby cubes while competing against one another. So this was the first script I ever wrote. It spent hours writing it, but I was able to reuse it to explore new forms I ever I never saw, uh, saw before. And it got me instantly hooked on using like, parametric modeling to explore form and function. Now, uh, the built environment has the potential to shape the way we think and interact the world, with the world around us. Louis Kahn, famous for his delicate architectural hand, once walked through the baths of Caracalla in Italy. The bathhouse has a 150 foot tall ceiling and Kahn noted that there, we are capable of taking a bath in an eight foot tall ceiling, yet there is something about a 150 foot tall ceiling that makes a person a different kind of person. This idea is not only about the scale of the space, but it points out that we are capable of living in these metaphorical eight-foot spaces, but why not push the limits and live in a 150-foot tall space? And could we design for this condition? Architectural design can be more than eight-foot tall ceilings, 
design can be as magnificent as a vast of terracotta. So what does it mean to seek out the 150 foot tall ceiling in the 21st century? It could mean that our designs and forms change based on the factors in the urban fabric around them. Imagine our designs taking into account new forms of data from the urban fabric. This diagram shows the triangular surfaces animating based on the position of the floating sphere, responding to the change of context, animating the form. Now, upon graduating, I began working for a firm focused on data science and visualization, where we brought together UI designers, policy wonks, data scientists, and software engineers to help organizations get their hands around big data problems in various areas within the urban resilience field across the world. And I'll go through one of the examples that we did at that, uh, at that office, and it gives you a little insight to like how I think about products and how I think about design, design spatial analytics across architecture, is that this right here is a cover page of what is often referred to as the RRAP report, or the Regional Risk Resilience Assessment Program, generated annually by the Department of Homeland Security to assess the resilience of cities across the United States. These reports can often be over 400 pages long, and you can imagine that there is a wealth of crucial information in these reports for mayors and decision makers when dealing with increasing number of natural disasters that we're observing, especially in reaction to climate change. However, we also know that these reports might fall on deaf ears, not because of the lack of importance, but because that they are cumbersome and too technical oftentimes for a decision maker to refer to when dealing with a citywide disaster. The decision space for leaders in these situations is often limited. And many officials are faced with making decisions on the fly as information is coming at them at a rapid pace. So we needed to find new ways and make that information easily accessible. Where we started was trying to look at the history of hurricanes and tropical storms across the eastern coast. We wanted to turn the insights from that report into visualizations. Starting with the, the history of it is that what you're seeing here is a heat map of a historical storms uh, provided by the NOAA uh, historical database, which has been tracking historical storms since 1850, which is also kind of just mind blowing that they have data going back that far. What happens here in this visualization in particular is that the user would slide across the time slider, have the storms animate across the screen. And as they would animate, they would leave a thumbprint creating that heat map. So from like, in this case, in 1933, you can see how many storms have historically impacted the Eastern coast along the United States. The next visualization is looking at uh, bridges. So every two years, the Army Corps of Engineers conducts a national bridge inventory where engineers evaluate the deck structure, superstructure, and substructure of all bridges across, uh, across America. The rating system is on a scale from zero to nine, where any uh, score on any subcomponent of the bridge that is below a four is considered deficient. So what you're seeing here are these orange dots in South Charleston, South Carolina, are deficient bridges where the size of each dot is signifies the amount of daily traffic that that bridge, ha uh, that bridge has. So we can see here, and it's probably indicative of a lot of the infrastructure we have here across America, is that we have lots of deficient bridges across America that we need to, need to maintain and fix. And what makes this data actionable is we took that national bridge inventory data and by combining it with evacuation routes and calculating the population which would be assigned to that given route, given an emergency order, we can start to evaluate which bridges might be in the, the pathway of an evacuation route. The arrows you see here are those evacuation routes provided by the South Carolina Risk Management Center. And if we follow the evacuation routes upstream north of Charleston, we can see that the bridges which will be critical to the safe evacuation from the peninsula are in fact deficient. This bridge in particular that, that, that we clicked on here uh, has a deficient deck structure and a deficient superstructure. So when the city resources are limited, this tool can be used to prioritize fixing bridges which are deficient by focusing on those which are in the pathway of critical evacuation routes. And also which we can probably think about potentially not trying to fix or have these bridges be out of service during, a, during hurricane season so they can be used for safe evacuation. So this is all to say that during that time working at my previous office, uh, I became instantly hooked on creating visualizations and working on urban resilience. And I even more so started developing the skills as a software developer combined with my background in urban planning and then used that to make intuitive UI and software development for decision making and then hopefully one day policy making. Now, today I work at Tom Pearson Fox Arch Associates, which is a global artificial firm that designs sustainable and impactful buildings at all scales and types. And specifically, I work on the KPFUI team, focused on facilitating quick decision making, expediting public approvals, and maximizing value for both our designers, but also thinking through the impact of the concepts of the urban fabric for our designs.
We have a library of tools and workflows created by answering questions posed throughout the architectural practice, from view analysis to walkability to outdoor thermal comfort and daylighting, where we use these tools to answer questions to respond to the architectural design practice. And in 2019, we released Scout, a 3D web platform used to visualize our generative, mo generative models. Scout is our shared web platform that helps our global firm ga gain quick data-driven insights, present to clients, and engage with the community. Through Scout, designers can collaborate easily and explore thousands, of, if, uh, even a few or thousands of options, and make more informed decisions and enjoy the creative freedom of visualizing the results. This project that you're seeing here in particular was a collaboration effort we did with the Hawaii Housing Authority where we focused on helping communicate what new density could mean for Hawaii, a community that's typically had a low urban sprawl across the entire islands. But they, they wanted to see what density could look like and what that could mean for affordable housing that they were trying to put in. And to have that conversation with the community, the engagement itself was successful since the community members could actually toggle between different options from a high density, high clustering urban plan and see the trade-off decisions. This allowed them to see that maybe we might not get the best views across the entire plan, but we also get increased thermal comfort and walkability. So it allowed those trade-off decisions and how to be able to interact with that data to make those, those, those uh, conversations happen. So that is my background, a uh, very quick TLDR background. Uh, my, my current role has been focused largely on creating tools to gain insight. A major component of what work, uh, a major component of that work is removing barriers to entry. So making sure that the, the, the gap between information and insight to the designer or to the architectural practitioner is as short as possible so they can use these tools very iteratively. Next, I will discuss what is Rhino Compute and why we should connect it to Python and vice versa to perform spatial analytics. So a tools that were all fairly common across the AEC industry like Rhino and Grasshopper have enabled our field to leverage visual programming to create complex geometries, environmental simulation, and so much more. Rhino Compute is a web service that provides an API for geometry calculations using Rhino's geometry library. It is typically run as a headless server, meaning that it has no user interface to interact with. The server can process incoming requests to perform geometric computations and or solve grasshopper definitions and return the result back to the client web browser, the plugin, or whatever interface you're using to interact with it. With the introduction of Rhino Compute, new computational avenues began to open up for designers enabling increased freedom to connect Rhino's geometry API with a growing field of data science and spatial analytics. What we have seen in our office is that we have architects and designers who need access to these analytics and insight throughout the design process. The specialists who create everything from a life cycle assessment tool to embodied carbon facade generation or generative design have been searching for ways how to effectively distribute these analytics across the entire office. One, to decrease management, because if you're handing off grasshopper scripts potentially to every single design team, you would then have to manage all those grasshopper scripts. And thankfully, I'll get to a little bit later that grass, the, the, the innovation of Rhino Compute allows us to minimize a lot of that management and allows us to distribute these uh, analytics effectively across the entire studio. And now we were able to start thinking of not just creating one-off workflows to answer a specific question on a, on a project, but begin creating products that can help us effectively manage our deployed technology across the entire office. We also want this work, new workflow with cloud computing to be a platform where everyone can contribute to contribute new tools and all work together. And here are the many different ways uh, David Leone, who is uh, the director of the MCAT program at IAC and I thought of how to connect a designer or a specialist uh, to analytics using Rhino Compute. So here you can actually see, we can connect it with Flask, we can connect it with Node.js, we can use Grasshopper through Hops. Today we'll be going over Jupyter Notebooks, but you can also on the far right, the, the other workflows, you can imagine uh, connecting an interface such as a web browser or another plugin and abstract all the complexity that the user never has to see Grasshopper or even interact with any of that uh, complexity. So the specialist creates these analytics, deploys them to the cloud, and then you're just worried about, you know, what's the interface we want to deploy these tools to our users student? A lot of that removes the barrier that might stand to intimidate some who have never used some of these complex tools to then use those tools and gain those analytic insights. So, in this workshop, we'll be connecting Jupyter Notebooks and Python, which is a common tool used by data scientists to analyze data sets and gain quick data-driven insights using Rhino Compute. 
focusing on moving data back and forth between the two technologies, creating the interoperability. So why connect Rhino and Jupyter Notebooks? Over the past uh, decade, the use of spatial analytics continues to grow from platform to platform with ever increasing number of software technologies, which could enable designers to understand the urban fabric of our cities. There are so many different layers of unraveling the urban complexity of a city, from different analyses you would want to conduct to different data sets you'd want to bring together to gain input. And the emergence of data science over the last five years to a decade has introduced so many different libraries that are at your disposal to do these analytics. So by joining Rhino with Python, you're effectively expanding your horizon for the analytics that you can create. And as architectural designs continue to think about not just designing their building, but the larger urban context, these tools required that bring these things into reality continue to change. And by connecting Rhino Compute to Python as a backend service, it opens up new doors for non-traditional architectural designers to use these same tools or create new ones alongside the architectural industry. And so with that, quick somewhat introduction, we'll actually be moving through a workshop and hands-on in code. And so I will. Uh, the GitHub link to the uh, to the workshop itself is available on the LinkedIn post that Nick Pedro added to the LinkedIn. So you can feel free to follow along. I will be moving somewhat quickly through it. I'll be introducing a lot of new things to you if you've never coded before, but don't worry. Hopefully it's easy to follow, but I'll go ahead and switch over to the notebook. So hopefully everyone's able to still see my screen, which it looks like they are. And so what you're seeing here is a Jupyter Notebook. And what we're going through is combining Python, Grasshopper, and Rhino together through a Jupyter Notebook using Rhino Compute to do some spatial analytics. And I'll, again, I'll be moving somewhat quickly through all these different pieces to hopefully give you a breadth of the art of the possible. And then in your own time, you can clone this repo, grab this notebook, and go through it uh, with a finer tooth comb. And hopefully, uh, my goal was to comment out every single line of code that I, I, I have here. So hopefully, it's easy to follow along. But if not, feel free to contact me or make a pull request even better on my GitHub repo if you have any questions. So if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks contain both rich text elements, such as figures, links, and equations, and also allows you to write Python code within the notebook itself. So you can combine your analysis, your code, and also your results and description all in one place, which makes it an ideal way to hand off analysis to someone who can just run that analysis quickly without ever having to interact with too much else. Um, notebooks are composed of cells. Each one of these cells can contain either Markdown or Python. You can have it uh, run out different uh, programming languages like R or even C that I've seen, uh, but those ones we'll just be covering Python today. So. If you want to run a markdown cell, you can see here, you can just change from markdown to code. And here I'm just writing some markdown. And if you want to run a cell, you either hit play button right here to run the cell out that you have highlighted here in blue, or you can click shift enter on any of the cells and you run them out. So the Python cell is, I'm just saying hello on Python. So I have a print statement here. The next cell here is a definition. And this is to introduce the idea that everything you run within a Jupyter Notebook it is available globally within the namespace of that Jupyter Notebook. And what that means is when I run out, say hello, I can call that function here and have it say hello to Python and hello to Optimus Prime, my favorite Autobot. And if you wanted to update that function and add additional exclamation, for example, I can update that function once, run it out, and then I can have it update on all the other functions or all the other calls to that function. And this is a great piece of what makes Jupyter Notebooks powerful. The more complex you get, this can be, uh, you just gotta be careful about the namespace that you give your functions because you don't want your functions to be cluttered and you call the wrong function when you're not meaning to, uh, which gets complex later on the line, but for this use case, it's very useful. So, Pandas, maybe if you've heard, like I feel like there's a lot of buzz around pandas over the last couple of years, especially as data science has grown more and more. So pandas is a fast and powerful, flexible way to manipulate data. It's a much faster, in my opinion, than Excel. And pandas is built upon NumPy. So that just means that the NumPy data structure of series and data frames is what pandas runs on. And is primarily used for statistical analysis, plotting of functions in matplotlib, or even feeding in data into a machine learning algorithm and which we'll get into a little bit later. So in all my sections where I introduce a new technology or a library, I have the installation link here and a short description. So hopefully that's useful. 
you can go ahead and click on any of those links and it should take you directly to the installation page. And for those of you who are following along on the GitHub repo, I have all the installation instructions laid out here and my recommendations. Uh, I would say while you're going through all this installation, one of the toughest pieces to install, and we'll get to this a little bit later, is GeoPandas, primarily because GDAL on certain computers, especially on Windows machines, can be a little tough to install. The best recommendation I have if you're following along is to do it through Anaconda, which creates containers of virtual environments, which becomes really effective, and you can run out these commands in the terminal that I have laid out to install all these dependencies to run out these libraries. So here I'll go over what a data frame is if you're not familiar. So a data frame is composed of multiple series. A series, you can think of it just as a column or an array of data. So here we have two series of apples and oranges and together when joined together, they make a data frame. And so we'll go through an example of what that can look like. So the, here, the apples and oranges are just a, an array of numbers that we're going to create a data frame with. And by passing in the, uh, the data frame as the last line in a cell, it automatically prints it out. If for whatever reason you don't want that behavior in a cell to happen, put a semicolon in there and it will not print out the last line. But if you want that, just put the, the whatever you want to print out in the last line of a cell in a Jupyter notebook, and it will print out whatever you have there um, in the last line, which is really helpful when you're just trying to create like a cohesive notebook. Here, we're using a describe function. This is probably one of the functions I use most often when I'm doing uh, analytics, is just to do a summary uh, analysis of the columns that I have. So here I can see the count and the mean and the deviations of my apples and oranges. And then next we'll go into matplotlib, which matplotlib, if you're not familiar, is a library for creating visualizations in Python. And the possibilities are honestly quite endless. When you go to matplotlib and you go to the examples, for everything that I've ever had to do for statistics or uh, even machine learning to visualize some of our results, there has not been too many things I have never, I have not found on matplotlib. So it's a really extensible library to do quick visualizations in your Jupyter notebooks. And the great thing is if you click on any of these examples, they'll have example code there for you and the example visualization itself. So it becomes really easy to pick this up and add it to your notebook as you need it. So we're gonna load that into memory. And here, we're actually gonna be going, just gonna do a simple plot of the apples that we have in our data frame. So here we have the observation of apples for the total count for each observation. Again, uh, we can add a function called plot to plot our, our uh, data for us. So here I can plot apples and I can plot oranges. And next, uh, I know that was moving somewhat quickly through pandas, through matplotlib to do quick graphing and very quick uh, data framing. And this is all just like, this information right here, again, is all, hopefully it's all laid out pretty well in the notebook itself. So feel free to give it a read. Uh, and every single line I have, you'll see, I have every single line commented out for you. Now we get to the actual spatial analytics section. So one of my favorite data sets, the primary land use tax law output or Pluto uh, for New York City reports tax law and building characteristics in geographic, political and administrative districts at the tax lot level uh, maintained by the Department of City Planning, Department of Finance, Department of Citywide Administrative, Administrative Services, which is a mouthful, and the Landmarks Preservation Committee or Commission. And so Pluto is a really unique data set that I've only really seen available here in New York City that it records all the information for a tax lot for all the building lot areas that we have here across New York City for all five boroughs. And one of the coolest parts is Pluto is actually managed through GitHub, which is a really cool facet of like the, the city government and the Department of City Plan hosting it this way, is that if you have any issues that you find on the Pluto data set itself, you can file an issue on their GitHub and they will respond to you and fix the issue. I had an issue when I first started at KPF of one of the, the areas for a plot of land was incorrect. I filed an issue and it was resolved pretty quickly. And this is just to say that my hat goes off to the primary city plan for creating such an interactive way for the community and the public to interact with the data set. Um, so feel free to check out their, their GitHub. It's really cool the work that they're doing. So what we're gonna be doing here is essentially we're gonna be taking all the Pluto tax lot data, which in this case, there's 800, 859,000 tax lots in uh, New York City. We're gonna be taking that data and doing some spatial analytics and just some very quick statistics on it, just to show like how quick we can grab this data and do some analysis on it. So here we're gonna grab the data from the New York City open data portal. 
And you can actually load the data in through a local file as well if you don't want to grab it through the uh, API. Uh, either way works exactly the same. I did it, I had both options here. So if you want to load this data in locally from the repository, that's you can do that too. So I already have the data loaded in here. This data is fairly large when it loads into memory. So it's a good time to go refill your coffee when you're running this at home or if you're following it along. Um, it will load. For me, it took like one to two minutes to load in. Uh, but once you get it loaded in, you have all 800,000 uh, or so tax slots loaded into memory. And here we can see all the different fields, uh, very similar to what you would see in like an Excel sheet, loaded into memory. So we can see the council district that the lot lives within. We can see the address, the zoning district, and all the other uh, features that the city planning and department of finance has in this data set, which is quite extensible. So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at land use. So quickly, I'm gonna grab all the unique uh, boroughs for uh, the Pluto data set. So we can see here, MN equals Manhattan. So we have Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, and Staten Island. And I just wanna see, you know, what's the land use distribution for Manhattan compared to the rest of New York City. So Manhattan has 42,000 tax lots and only makes up 4.97% of all tax lots in the Pluto data set. Uh, it only makes up 7.39 of all lot area. So it means like, you know, Manhattan is so much smaller in terms of lot area comparatively to like Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island. And the interesting part, it only makes up 32% of all built area in New York City. And uh, I just thought it was interesting to think about, like we think about Manhattan having all the density, uh, one of the densest areas in the country. And it only makes up 32% of all built area across all five boroughs. I think it's interesting too is that you know if you grab this data set so let's say it takes you one to two minutes to grab this data set by loading it into memory you can see how few lines of code it takes me to get these high level summary statistics so we're essentially able to grab a data set of eight hundred thousand, do some high level statistics in less than five minutes or so and that's really the power of pandas um and it's worth noting that pandas while an incredibly robust tool especially compared to trying to do analytics in excel uh does have its limits when you start hitting those limits of like gigabytes and gigabytes of data, you'll move on to the next step, which is a lot of fun that I always had fun doing, which is PySpark and Hadoop using MapReduce to further extend your ability to process very large chunks of data. But that's just say like that will be coming down the line, hopefully maybe another talk. But uh, what we're gonna do look at now is actually the land use distribution. So I just wanna see, you know, what's the top land use across the Pluto data set? So by grabbing the different land use uh, districting, so all the different land use descriptions, which you can find here in the Pluto dataset dictionary. So we can see here, they have a data dictionary for all the different land uses and all the different variables they have in Pluto dataset. So here, I just wanted to see, you know, what's the top land use category for Manhattan. So here I can see the top one for Manhattan is mixed residential and commercial buildings with 12,000 lots falling within that category. Next up is multifamily walk-up buildings and so on and so forth. So again, we're able to do it with three lines of code to grab that data, summarize all of its information and get some get some insight to what's the top land use category from Manhattan. Oh, here, uh, this is just, a, I did the same thing that you do here, but I just wanted to do it in a tree map um, just to see the proportions of mixed like multifamily buildings versus all the other categorizations. You know, we can see public facilities makes up a fairly large chunk compared with two uh, parking facilities, which uh, I'm surprised even how much parking facilities make up tax lots in Manhattan, which is kind of staggering that we still have <laughs> parking structures. Anywho, here we're going to be loading in GeoPandas, and we're also going to be loading in SKLearn. So GeoPandas is the a, pretty much the exact same thing as Pandas. The, the difference is that first uh, prefix is Geo. It adds in the spatial component to Pandas, and you'll see that coming up here soon. And SKLearn is an open source machine learning library that supports supervised and unsupervised learning and is used widely across the field. It also provides various tools for model fitting, data processing and model selection and evaluation and many other utilities. Uh, today, we'll be using k-means clustering to cluster similar tax lots to one another and color them based on their similarities. So if you're not familiar, uh, a quick TLDR on k-means is k-means is an ability to separate out a data set based on their similarities. So your data set has hundreds of different features and you wanna see which features are most like each other. So you feed in the number of clusters that you want. So in this, in this example, there's three clusters, blue, yellow, and green. And what it does is based on the similarities of those clusters, it does the mean squared error distance from all the different points and assigns them based on that. 
So all those points in blue have similarities to each other more so than they have similarities to the green cluster or the yellow cluster. It allows us to do a quick uh, run through the data set to see the, the possible separations and similarities between all of our data features. So here, I load in a local data set, which is included in the GitHub repo of the exact same data set from Pluto. The only difference is I, I pared it down just a little bit just to make processing a little quicker. And then you can see here, the real power of GeoPandas is the geometry section. So we have lat longs attached to the data set, which means that we can do some spatial analytics with it. So I load it into memory. Then I wanted to create some maps and just to see the distribution of FAR across the entire data set for, New for Manhattan. So when I first look at the data set with no filtering on it, um, the, there's an outlier in the data set, which skews the ability to run a chloropleth. When I clamp the data set at 30, we can actually see the distribution of FAR across Manhattan. You know, we have, we have heavy density in uh, financial districts, the distribution across Midtown. And I was kind of curious when I ran this about what this yellow dot was, which has anywhere upwards of 25 to maybe even 30 FAR. So I looked at it on Zola, which is the Pluto data sets interactive map. And I saw this tax lot has 13,435,076 square feet for gross floor area. And I had a hard time believing that that was real. So I went on Google Street View and I saw it was a church. And uh, the director of KPFUI theorized that potentially that number is not accurate, that that area does not have a gross floor area of 13 million feet. But the interesting part, just from like a data set perspective, is that since this is potentially a religious uh, ownership of this tax lot, that the, the Department of Finance has no real reason to verify that number and make it correct. So they're not collecting taxes from that lot, which is just, it's a theory. I think it's interesting to think about like why a number might be incorrect in a data set is because it might be a religious exemption. Moving on uh, to that, to looking at the distribution of FAR. Now what we want to do is I want to look at the K-means clustering of this data set. And what we're going to do is that we're going to grab the land use categorization, the residential FAR, commercial FAR, facilities FAR, and the number of floors. And it's worth noting, if you want to run this algorithm for, or K-means algorithm for any of the other distribution or any other features in the data set, you can go ahead and grab any of these features, uh, granted if they're an actual numerical feature and, and, a re and a regression feature, and then plug them into here. And what we're going to do here is actually loop through and calculate what is the optimal number of features or optimal number of clusters for the k-means algorithm. So the k-means algorithm, again, what we're trying to do is decrease the amount of distance between each cluster. And what I mean by that is decrease the mean squared error for the cluster. So like all the points are tightly clustered together, meaning that if we run this algorithm on new data, we could actually you know, confidently say this belongs to the blue cluster and it does not belong to the yellow cluster. So what we do is we run uh, essentially what they call an elbow test. And the elbow test means that I run out every single um, number of clusters. So this is with four clusters, with six, with eight, to try to see the similarities change over time. And what we can see here is the mean squared distance between each cluster actually decreases in the, the more clusters we, we create, which makes sense. So the more freedom we give it to separate the data out in different categories or different clusters, it's able to correctly categorize new data or the data set that it has. So we can say that the reason it's called the elbow feature or elbow test is that this kind of looks like an elbow. <laughs> and what we're looking for is when the elbow starts becoming plateaued, where we're not really gaining that much more information by continuing on creating more clusters. So I'm going to stay at 10 clusters. We're not really gaining that much from the delta between 10 to 12 or 10 to 14. And so by running out 10 clusters, we can see, we can run that out from Manhattan and see which tax lots based on those characteristics that we ran before, those characteristics being land use, commercial FAR, uh, residential FAR and the others to see which ones are similar to one another based on those characteristics. And now the actual interoperability uh, is actually, let's say we ran this data out, we ran in Python, we ran our Jupyter notebook, and now you want, for whatever reason, you want to save it back into Rhino to use that data for other work. So here we're going to be using the Rhino 3DM library and the compute library uh, utility functions. So here we're actually going to be converting that uh, this data set right here, and we're going to save it as a Rhino 3DM file. Uh, so you can have it in Rhino do with additional manipulations on it. So the main points that I, I want to point out here, and again, hope every line is commented out. So as you're going through this at home, you can feel free to read the comments and go through it line by line 
is the main points is that it's right here, is that we're setting the data for each cluster uh, of, the, of each geometry tax plot as a user object. And so you can add as many user objects as you want to this file. And so let's say you had 20 different features you wanted to bring back in Rhino, you can add them as a user string in the object, as a key value pair. And what we'll do, once you save it to disk, you'll see in my code, at least, it says finish writing to disk. And I'll go ahead and pull that up. Oops, I need to quickly find it. So I think the, I just didn't move it to, there it is. <laughs> I didn't move it to zero, zero. So here, if we open up perspective view, we have our tax lots. And as promised, if you click on one of these, like these tax lots and go to its properties, we can see the data that we had in Python correctly exported and now available in Rhino, which means if you want to run this workflow with additional information in Grasshopper or whatever else in Rhino, you have that data available to you. So it's a very good way to move data back and forth between Python and Rhino using the Rhino 3DM library in Python. So every single one of these has their cluster assignment that we ran out in Python. So you could do visualizations on this or whatever else you needed to do. Um, and that's saving data from a pandas data frame back into Rhino um, for whatever other features you want to run out. Whew, I know that was covering a lot of, of ground. <laughs> and hopefully that all made sense. Uh, next, uh, and feel free, I'm sure we'll have questions in the chat. So if you have any questions on anything, feel free to add them to the chat. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll have time to go over some questions at the very end. Uh, so here we're going to actually go do some uh, more, more advanced workflow is that we're going to connect Grasshopper and Hops to our Jupyter Notebook and run out a workflow. So as I described before, Rhino Compute is a headless uh, web service of Rhino. So to open up, if you don't have it installed, again, this is all outlined on the GitHub uh, here on the GitHub for this workshop. And the really cool thing is McNeil has a fantastic web page on the Hops component and Hops is Rhino Compute. And they have examples uh, for installing. The main thing that you want to look at is that to install Hops or Rhino Compute on your uh, on your desktop for Rhino, all you need to do is go to the command prompt, go to the package manager. In this search bar, type in Hops. And you'll see Hops right here. And you can install it um, very easily through there. The only other piece to, to check out is when you install Hops, one thing that I find useful when I'm doing debugging is in Grasshopper, when you open up Grasshopper to go to preferences, and you'll see this pop up uh, to launch Rhino Compute at Windows Start and to uncheck to not hide it. Now, if you're running this and you're confident of everything that you're doing uh, is right and you don't want to look at the debug information, you can leave that checked off. But what that does is it actually spins up the, it allows you to see the window of Rhino Compute. And so typically you don't have to look at this unless you're debugging, but this is what Rhino Compute looks like on your terminal window. So this will spin up once you open up Grasshopper in Rhino. And so going back to our notebook. So once you have Rhino Compute hops installed, what I'm doing here is I'm calling the Rhino Compute server on my local machine and it runs on 6000, port 6001. And if for whatever reason 6001 is filled on your computer, it's already been tasked by it by a different thread, uh, it will go on to 6002, 6003, and so on. So here I'm just doing a version test to make sure my Rhino compute is running. And I just ran out that cell. And if we go to the bottom, we can see the, the 200 request that it got the request and responded and returned with the version number of our Rhino compute. So that's just me knowing that Rhino compute is actively running and I can connect it to my Python notebook. So these classes right here are, and these definitions are just uh, some utility definitions. You can reuse these in whatever workflow you want to get the curves or get the breadths of a Rhino object from a Rhino 3DM file. And this right here is just doing the, the, the encoding of that file. So what we're gonna be doing here in this workflow is taking a geometry, taking an open space ratio, a site curve and a building height, doing programmatic geometry generation, and then doing daylight and simulation using, uh, using Rhino Compute. So this is our example file, which is a file that we use often on the KPFUY team. One, it's an abstracted version of Bryant Park uh, using geometry from the open data portal from New York City. Obviously, you can tell this is not realistic since there is no, uh, <laughs> currently there is no river adjacent to Bryant Park, but we use this as like a sandbox file. 
And we also use this sometimes as a file to break our tools to see how we can fix them because some of the geometry from the city uh, could be a little bit better. <laughs> like you can see some of these files, um, some of the geometry is, is pretty, pretty nuts. But we can use it for our example purposes to be as, as a, an example. So this is the site curve we're going to be using. So we're going to be creating a daylight simulation here. So what we're going to be doing first is loading in that Bryant Park 3DM file from memory or from the local file. And this Bryant Park file is included in the Rhino or in the GitHub repo. So feel free to download that and access it that way. And so what we're going to do here is load in the file and grab some of the geometry from that file. So in particular, we're grabbing the site curve and we're grabbing all of the breps um, from the surrounding context. And once it's loaded in, you'll see that it's loaded and uh, it's correctly encoded. And as I mentioned before, this is the diagram of what we're going to be doing throughout this, this next workflow. So here I'm loading in the geometry generation uh, grasshopper file and the daylighting uh, grasshopper file. So you can imagine, and I know this may be a little abstract, but you can be a specialist, give someone pathways to these files, and they can just run it uh, on their Python and never have to open the grasshopper script themselves. You just tell them what inputs you're expecting and what outputs to expect, and they never have to open Grasshopper. So it allows that communication, potentially brokerage of communication, without ever having to open Grasshopper itself. So this is the data structure for Rhino Compute, uh, similar to that of what we're imagining for trees uh, in Grasshopper. So we're going to be plugging in the open space ratio, the floor height we want, and the site curve, which are these variables up here. And we're going to be sending that to the Rhino Compute server. So this is going to be sending a post request to the Rhino Compute at the Grasshopper endpoint. And what that does is it grabs the Grasshopper script we loaded in and we passed in um, here in the algo key. And then it passes in the parameters. And the cool thing, I can illustrate that for you. If I can find which ones. Yeah. OK, here we go. So this is the geometry. It opens up. There we go. So this is the Grasshopper file. And this is the contextual inputs that Grasshopper has now, where you can see site, floor height, open space ratio are named that way. And it corresponds to how we have them named uh, in our parameters. So this is how you link those two pieces up. And this is also documented on Rhino's uh, hops component section of how these uh, contextual inputs work with Rhino Compute if you need further clarification. So we're going to run this out. And we're going to create a number of buildings with a certain floor area. And then once we run those out, we can actually run out the daylight simulation. And from that daylight simulation, we're going to, we actually are able to run out the entire daylight for that geometry in Python without ever having to really open Grasshopper. So I have them opened here, but you actually don't need them open. You can just have them as files that you pull in through Python and never have to open Grasshopper and just run out as if you were running out any other API in Python. And so that is the workflow. We're able to get a daylight number. So this is the daylight number for every single cell that was created uh, in that workflow. And this is using Ladybug for that. So just to give you some insight into that, we, collect, we took the site curve, the building, and a weather file. In this case, it was New York City. And we did a 15 by 15 meter grid. And it outputs a daylight result and a daylight mesh. And those are returned back to you in Python. So you can continue to do different analysis to it. So. This was, uh, I know I moved very quickly through here, but we were essentially able to run Rhino Compute with our Python without ever really having to interact with Rhino interface itself. So you're able to, if you're a data scientist and only know Python and not familiar with Rhino and vice versa, you can interoperate between the two. So when the last time we have here, I'm actually gonna be going through a, a different example and I'll be moving somewhat, let's see here. So, <laughs> and I, I'm hoping to leave some time for questions. So I'm sure there'll be a lot. Uh, so where do we go from here? Let me go ahead and share my screen again. So we have the ability to visualize massive amounts of data using these workflows and gain insights. But on our team in particular, we need a way to think about the tools we use and how we deployed them. So this is uh, one of the initial diagrams uh, actually drawn by a former KPFUI member, Demi Chang. Uh, thank you, Demi, for the always wonderful diagrams. But we imagined how could we connect Rhino to our Rhino, or how could a local version of Rhino on a designer's computer connect it to our Rhino compute server and then connect it to Scout, which is our 3D web interface? And how can we have people upload new data and geometry and analysis they want? So we did this, thankfully, using Rhino compute. So what we did is create a plugin. 
So in Render Compute, and this is really what I wanted to get at, is that this allows us to run out Grasshopper scripts through a plugin. So this is actually hidden our cloud service in Rhino Compute. The, the designer is in Rhino. They don't have to leave it. They don't have to open Grasshopper. And they're able to run out our analyses all in the cloud. And so all they have to worry about is what settings they have and making sure that they're meeting modeling standards for their Rhino files. And then once they're done, they can go ahead and upload that data into our Scout interface. And this does it automatically. So this is creating a new way for us to deliver tools across the office. Thankfully, thanks to Rhino Compute, the Python workflow I showed is how I oftentimes interact with it because Python is like one of my first languages now. But this is using taking data from Rhino, grabs information from the geometry, sends it up to our compute server, similar to what we did in the Python uh, code, solves it using the Grasshopper script, sends the analytics back to the user, and then we can upload it to our 3D web interface. So this offers a whole new breadth of capability that we didn't have before. And this is all in an effort to remove the technical barriers which might be preventing designers from accessing analytic tools or insights by being smart of how we deploy software solutions across the studio. Eliminate the challenges of missing Grasshopper components or incorrect versions of plugins or Grasshopper potentially crashing or passing Rhino files back and forth. By putting it and centralizing it all onto our cloud server, we are able to try to get to that point where we're trying to just offer as few clicks as possible to gain access to the analytic. And what this looks like is that this can increase the response time of a specialist in our office. By creating tools that allow them to have better conversations with design teams and enable designers to start using these tools without having to be an expert in Grasshopper or other software. By fusing cloud computations, robust analytic tools and UI, we can deliver insights to design teams faster than they ever have before. And we want to close the technical gap between the specialist and the design team so we can improve our designs, understand the urban and social context better in cities, and respond to change in the design process more effectively. And in conclusion, software development like this can be paired with the user interface within the AAC industry, can empower designers to remove technical barriers to insights throughout the design process, enabling design teams to better understand their building, site, and urban fabric of cities. And with that, thank you. Many thanks, Brandon, uh, for the presentation. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, well, I'm sure the attendants have enjoyed the presentation as much as we had uh, and have learned for sure a new way of using Reno, Rhino uh, for data analytics. Uh, Fantastic, yeah. It was yeah, great. Many, many comments uh, congratulating you and thanking you and some, some, some questions. questions as well that I think Pedro is Stacking note. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, for example, Jack Cole asked if uh, you have any idea of uh, uh, if this sort of tax uh, law data or anything similar is coming to other cities, uh, say London, for example. The, the, the Pluto tax law data? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. When I first moved here to New York City, I was shocked at the specificity and the robustness of the Pluto tax law data. I theorized once I saw it that this should be available for every single city. Um, and really, I think it really is a joint effort between the Department of Finance and the Department of City Planning to make that data set available as rich and robust as it is. So if, uh, if it's not available in your city, I would, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we can start petitioning our city agencies to start creating that data set. Okay, thanks. And Joel Oda asked as well if this plugin can run in a headless server that runs uh, Reno Compute at AWS. Yes, so our plugin itself for our office, we run everything on our cloud service. So our Rhino Compute runs on cloud, but you can also run Rhino Compute as you saw locally on your computer. Running it locally is useful for like debugging and working through your, you know, if you're trying to create a Grasshopper script that's ready for Rhino Compute, it's really useful. And then once you're ready and it works locally, we, we toss it onto our Windows server on the cloud. That way, anyone in our office can access that um, anywhere from the studio. So it, it runs headless on a, on a Windows server that we have uh, on the cloud. OK. And uh, personal question, Brandon, do you think is there an ideal platform to communicate the results of uh, this um, analysis? Sure. So uh, if maybe what I can do to answer that particular question is 
this is a little tangential, but hopefully it'll be it'll help answer that question in particular. Is this was a school project I did, and without going too much into the weeds, I ran outdoor comfort using Ladybug and pedestrian flow using Urbano. And I did the exact workflow that I showed there, running it in Python, and eventually I moved it into the web. And I'm a web visualization geek, so I always end up in the web anyway. <laughs> so I would say for this analysis, to send this off to someone, it's really helpful to send this through a web interface. So here I was visualizing thermal comfort across three parks for Washington Square, uh, Madison Park, and Brooklyn Commons um, for these analysis. So my answer uh, to that is I usually deploy our tools to the web so it's easily accessible to everyone in the office or even our clients. Okay. More questions from Evangelos Pantadi. Uh, did you build the Rhino Compute plugin using C Sharp? Yes, the plugin itself on the on the designer's Rhino interface is built in C Sharp using a WPF. WPF. Okay. Pablo Arango asks, uh, there are any limitations for the plugins that, that can be used in the Hetel server? Sure, that's a, that's a very good question. So what we've done is our Grasshopper scripts, we've had to, one, I found one that's most interesting is analytics across the board, whether involved in Rhino Compute or not, modeling standards have to be there, right? Because you can, you can solve the uh, deployment of a tool, but you have to make sure modeling standards are, are there for your office or your studio. Secondly, the limitations of the plugin itself what we've done is that we programmatically generate the interface for the plugin based on the inputs of the Grasshopper script. So if it's expecting a string, a number, uh, or a weather file in this case, you just have to be you know, thinking through what those interfaces are for your plugin so you can make sure you can handle that, collect that input from the Rhino canvas or from the user itself or the user themselves, and then be able to send that to the Rhino compute server. It's worth noting, and I, uh, I know I have you know uh, other uh, McNeil associates here. So I know like at the end of the day, Rhino Compute running on a server solving Grasshopper scripts is somewhat similar to running it on your local machine. If the Grasshopper script takes a long time to run locally, uh, depending on the resources you have available on your cloud computer or your cloud instance, you, you're still going to be experiencing those those run times. So just be sure that you know like how like being smart about how you write if you're solving it in Grasshopper scripts, like being smart about how you write those Grasshopper scripts. And in this tool in particular. For the plugin, we are really focused on delivering insights quickly. So on that plugin itself, we have different settings for how uh, like how specific or how the, the resolution of the analytics. So if someone wants it fast, they can get it quickly. If they want to run out a more robust solution or a higher resolution, we, we give them that option. So I think that spectrum of options is really helpful when someone's interacting with a plugin such as that. Thanks. And another question from Mr. Parametrics for Arts. Uh, have you uh, tested the workflow in R, uh, R Studio, perhaps through Reticulate? Interesting. Yeah, I I was I was raised on Python and then eventually Jupyter Notebooks. My master, so I have not touched R for this particular workflow. However, I wouldn't, you know, without being an expert, I don't want to speak for that. But I would imagine it would work. Uh, but I have not tested it myself. Okay, I'm collecting more questions. Uh, Brandon, sorry if I can answer to you. Uh, yeah, Isadora Tebaldi asks if, uh, if it's possible to cancel a request to Reno Compute that is that is taking too long to respond. Interesting, interesting. That's a that's a very good question. So yeah, if you're running out like a really intensive, like let's say like a daylight and simulation for thermal comfort in your analysis grid. No, I just, I just have to paint the picture in my head. Like your analysis grid is really small and that, that's taking some time. Uh, we haven't we haven't run into that problem uh, for the most part. We have our responses down to a reasonable amount. The times that we've had Rhino, let's say like a grasshopper script failed because the the script itself was what had some incorrect components or other pieces, I haven't looked particularly into canceling that from the client interface. We do have a monitor now where we, we're, we're attempting to monitor the Rhino computes health, like the, the services health. So we get pings if the, the children on that or the children processes are available for, for um, computing. But no, I haven't looked into canceling requests midway through. I'm guessing the TCP re request would time out if it doesn't get a response and you would get the error and you would probably have to handle that error either through your, if you have like a node server in between or on the client plugin. 
Perfect. Uh, Andres Buidrago, what strategy do you use to deploy your maps or models with analysis to web? Sure. So the one I showed was uh, I used Mapbox to do a lot of that work. Mapbox has come so far <laughs> through like if you can get spatial th things spatially uh, located, things can pretty much for the most part come out of the box to show your 3D models because uh, Mapbox works very well with 3.js now. And there's some great examples online of how to do that. So you can get 3D models and analysis meshes represented in the web fairly straightforward. So I would say Mapbox and 3.js are the, probably the fastest ways uh, to get that going. Okay. Uh, well, Isadora Tebaldi has a question, but I think this is more for our internal uh, development well, I team. Th I think she has a few questions. Yeah, the first one, one I just... Yeah, we uh, missed one part in the other question. She asked also if there is a Docker image for an easy setup of Rhino compute. It was related to the, if you could cancel a request that was uh, taking too long. And then if there is any Docker image for an easy setup of compute. We haven't used Docker necessarily. So we have an AMI that we use for our cloud instance that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. The hard part, when I think of Docker, I think a lot of it when I'm spinning up like Linux servers or uh, Ubuntu servers for that instance, to spin them up very quickly for like load balancing to handle different requests. But Windows servers take quite a while to spin up. So <clears> spinning, <throat> up on, spinning them up on the fly, if like one of your services goes down, like you're gonna have a delay because Windows takes time. That doesn't mean that you can't use Docker to create a container for your image, but we just haven't used that yet because we just, if we have to spin up the server, it's booting from, from disk from the AMI. Okay. Okay. There is also one comment by Afonso. Do you see it, Pedro? Yes. Uh, a last comment for, well, the complaints there yeah. in, in, in Brazil related to, yeah, to get the data from the administration. Uh, I don't, I don't get it. Could you elaborate further, Afonso? Because you say, uh, of course, an analysis and access to information could be useful for different fields, just a comment. But what is your complaints about? Maybe that the data is not the, correct? Yeah, or... the, the, the data is not open source in, in Brazil, I think. Okay. Mm. Okay. And the yeah, last one by, by Isadora as well. If we can run compute uh, inside an Amazon Web Server Lambda function. Hmm. So cloud or hmm. uh, serverless Lambda function to run Rhino Compute. I would imagine off the cuff that you would have a Lambda function handle the, the request because you, know, you would probably want a authentication server in front of your Windows <laughs> Rhino Compute instance just to make sure that no, like no one who's not authorized to use it is using it. So I can imagine because we have like a you know we have a middle end in between our Rhino instance and our plugin to act as an authentication server. So I can imagine Lambda functions could do that for you. But I haven't tested a Lambda function to uh, to handle the Rhino compute call itself. Although you can, this is makes me probably thinking out loud. You can probably you can call an endpoint through a Lambda function. So maybe I, I'd be curious. You know, if someone wants to someone wants to test it and publish some article on it, I'd be interested. <laughs> Again, to Isadora and the rest of the people, feel free to post these questions uh, on the on the Rhino forum, because well, our, our developers are also there, and and we can start some discussions here because it's it's always in progress, compute, so we can add uh, any new features you request, like for example, or in this case, we take also note about Theodora's suggestion to to organize a webinar about production deploy on AV. AWS and yeah Afonso con confirms that the thing is that in Brazil that is not open source <clears throat> the which which uh, piece of technology was not open source the um, the um, yeah the data you get from the administration yeah the urban data I think urban data in, oh uh... okay Go gotcha okay perfect thank you so That's excellent. I think we ran out of time. It's a lot of information Great. today.
Yeah. Thank you all so much for having me. Hopefully uh, it all made sense. I know I went through a lot of content pretty quickly. So oh, it was amazing. And thank to the audience, uh, to the audience, uh, the webinar uh, is being recorded. And so it's, it's available on this same YouTube link uh, right after it finishes in case you miss some parts of it or you want to share it with your colleagues. Many thanks again. Thank you, Pedro, Brandon. We will see us, well, in a few weeks, I guess there will be new webinars. Thank you very much, Carlos, for being here with me. Um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, have a nice day, nice afternoon, or nice evening, depending where in which part of the world you are. <laughs> Bye.